so uh, we would like to connect uh, actually string theory also to particle physics and hopefully at some point confront it with experimental predictions. So the topic of uh, my uh, uh, talk here is uh, the, the study of F-theory compactification where we encounter more than one U1 factors. The work is based on recent uh, 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 two papers. Uh, the first one was initiated, uh, that initiated this effort uh, is with Dennis Clevers, a postdoc at Penn, and Hernan Piragua, uh, a student at Penn. And a follow-up work is also in collaboration with Antonella Grassi, and we hope to have a, a number of follow-up papers. Uh, some of the uh, th things I'm going to talk to about will also be uh, related to some previous work with Thomas Grimm and Dennis Clevers. So I would like to motivate why we are interested in studying F-theory compactification with more, uh, with additional U1 factors. Well, first, why F-theory compactification? The first motivation is from the particle physics perspective, because we believe that is actually an important broad domain of string theory compactifications that may give us promising particle physics. Uh, in particular, in the recent years, there was focus on grand unified models, like SU5 models with promising Yukawa couplings, and also uh, the issue of modularized stabilization uh, may be addressed in a promising way in this context. In particular, the construction of grand unified models led to big activities a number of years ago, uh, first focusing on local constructions, but then later on pursuing also compactification on globally defined compact spaces. The second motivation for F-theory is that actually it's conceptually intriguing because it allows us to study type 2b theory at a final coupling where these seven brains are in accounting for completely. And as a consequence, produces a beautiful geometrical description of compactification of this theory on elliptically fibered Calabi-Yau manifolds. Well, this is uh, by compactification on, on F-theory. Uh, but now the question is why I would be interested in abelian symmetries in F-theory. Well, study of abelian symmetries also has uh, important motivation in particle physics. In particular, it's a, uh, an in ingredient that is often encountered in building uh, models beyond the standard models. For example, if additional U1 gauge bosons are light, this could uh, lead to intriguing augmentation of uh, MSSM model to an MSSM, we may need it for Petri Queen symmetry and so on. If additional U1 gauge bosons are very heavy, there is still a leftover global symmetry, and thus such additional global symmetry can provide important selection rules to eliminate certain R parity violating terms, maybe shedding light on neutrino masses and so on. Well, there is, of course, also conceptual interest in studying such abelian symmetries because it leads to new types of elliptic vibrations in F-theory compactification, which is related to so-called mortal vague group of elliptic vibrations, whose torsion part has been studied in the past. However, the free part associated with the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the abelian U1 symmetries was, is less understood. In particular, there are important global issues there, and also very few systematic studies were done as far as uh, additional U1 factors go, in contrast to extending both math and physics literature on studies of appearance of non-abelian gate symmetries. So because I will probably run out of time, let me outline and summarize the, the outcome of my talk. So uh, the, uh, the core part of, the, uh, of, of this presentation is really construction of Calabi-Yau manifolds that have uh, two U1 factors and correspond to elliptically fibered Calabi-Yau manifolds whose modal V group is of rank two. 
why not rank one? Well, rank one has been addressed. Determination, uh, 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 this study actually allows us to determine completely the full spectrum of matter. By that I mean both representations and multiplicity of matter in uh, six dimensional and four dimensional compactifications. For four dimensional compactification, we also had to construct the general so called G4 flux on ca uh, such Calabiao fourfolds, and th this leads to actually first such construction on rank two uh, Vordel Vey group uh, Calabiao manifolds. Uh, as a consequence, we, we obtain explicit constructions with generic U1 cross U1 gate symmetry as well as grand unified symmetries with two additional U1 factors. Well, in, in this context, my view is that there, were, there are two important advances. One is from the point of view of geometry. In particular, what we uh, found out is that geometry for six dimensional compactifications completely determines the matter spectrum, namely the matter representations and multiplicity of matter. In four dimensions, it allows us to study G4 fluxes and also determine to, to some extent uh, matter surfaces, which allow us then to uh, identify the chiralities of the corresponding matter representations. In a complementary direction, uh, one advanced also some understanding of M theory, F theory duality in three dimensions by uh, imposing physical constraints from M theory on F theory. Uh, flux determinations, and then as a consequence in this three-dimensional duality determines Simon's terms that we determine with this constraint fluxes in M-theory allow us as a consequence to determine actually all chiralities of matter representations in four dimensions as well as confirm completely the anomaly cancellation of such spectrum. Okay. So uh, uh, let me uh, try to highlight few core things about F-theory compactification and the perspective I'm going to take is going to be type 2B perspective. Uh, last year at Strings I had the opportunity to talk about the work on the instantons in F-theory and there actually the perspective was more from the heterotic M-theory duality. So in the uh, uh, F-theory formulation uh, the core object, geometric object, is a torus. It's actually an SL2Z invariant, uh, allows us to formulate type 2B string theory in SL2Z invariant form, where a modular parameter of this torus specifies the axion dilaton of the type 2B theory. In compactification, this torus is fibered over the base that we typically parameterize with Weierstrass parametrization uh, of uh, 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 torus parametrization uh, is in terms of uh, s such a function relation of the torus coordinates and f and g functions are actually functions of uh, the base coordinates. In particular, when the, uh, when the vibration of the torus degenerates, uh, the, the typically the string coupling of type 2B theory uh, becomes very large and it's associated typically with appearance of the seven brains in the base. So, uh, uh, so the core in the study of string theory compactification is uh, really to understand uh, the space of this uh, uh, elliptic vibrations which produce in general singular elliptic Calabiao manifolds. In particular, the singularities of, uh, of, of the Calabiao manifolds turn out to encode a complicated setup of the seven brains from the type 2B perspective. In particular, could I mention two, uh, could I mention one singularities in the base are as associated with the appearance of the seven brains? Could I mention two singularities, typically intersections of such two dimension one uh, singularities, are as associated with the intersection of these seven brains, and in order to uh, obtain uh, actually chiral matter 
that appears at, at such intersections, one also has to add uh, for uh, a G4 flux at such, uh, that, uh, that then contributes to non-trivial chiral matter associated with such intersection. We could also look at the triple intersections uh, corresponding to, could I mention, three singularities in the base, which are associated with the Yukawa couplings. So uh, with this very, uh, just uh, overview, very brief uh, of uh, the essence of F-theory compactification, let me now turn to how to construct actually Karabiao fourfolds, uh, manifolds uh, that have this particular Model of a group symmetry of rank two and thus associated U1 cross U1 symmetry in the compactification. So the abelian gauge fields in four dimensional action actually can be found through classical Kaluza Klein reduction of the three form fields uh, that is expanded in terms of the corresponding 1,1 forms on the uh, Calabiao manifold. So the essence is how to construct such uh, one comma one forms that would in, in turn support the four dimensional U1 gauge field. And this construction goes via what we refer to as rational sections and is related to identifying first rational points on a particular elliptic curve that also has zero point. So, uh, for example, if we choose a particular field of numbers in Weierstrass parametrization, such a rational point would be point on, a, on an elliptic curve specified by the coordinates in this field. It turns out that those rational uh, points form a group under addition, actually the uh, modal way group of rational points. When promote such elliptic curve, now to the, uh, see, such rational points turn out to induce rational section, uh, sections. And uh, such sections via, via Shuda map are related now to divisor classes and this uh, fourfold compactification. Oops. So, uh, so this, uh, this particular sections are by Shuda map related to the divisors that are carried dual to the corresponding 1-1 one, one forms. Uh, so, uh, so in particular, the existence of such rational section uh, as a consequence uh, produces for us 1,1 one, one forms that support a billion U1 gauge fields. So with this basics, uh, what we turn out to uh, do is uh, construct such elliptic curve that have rank two uh, model way group. Uh, so we have to identify elliptic curves. We have two rational points, Q and R, in addition to the zero point, P. And it turns out that the generic, uh, uh, the generic elliptic curve of that type has a natural representation as a hypersurface in Del Peso 2. Namely, Del Peso 2 is a, a blow up of P2 at two points and uh, the particular hypersurface uh, equation uh, is specified by a number of coefficients that live in the, uh, in the field of numbers. Okay. So with this particular specification of the, rational, uh, of the elliptic curve with such rational points, it turns out that actually the the concrete rational points, the zero point and the two additional rational points are related uh, basically to the uh, intersection of the corresponding divisors associated with homogeneous coordinates of the DP2 and the uh, 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 hypersurface uh, constraint. So now we have to turn to promoting this rational uh, uh, points on elliptic curve and uh, to the whole vibration. And so in particular, what we have to, in particular, now construct is Calabiao fourfold with such properties of the fiber. And in the ambient space, what we have to do is actually do DP2 vibration over the base. And it turns out that the, the, such a vibration in the ambient space is specified really only by two divisors in the base, which are associated with the low side of the two sections, S7 and S9. So, the Calabiao hyperspace 
uh, hypersurface in, in this ambient space cuts out an elliptic curve E that I just described on the previous page. And in addition, we have to now promote coefficients SI in, uh, uh, into sections on the base B, and it turns out that actually only two of them are independent. And in addition, coordinates of DP2 are also promoted to sections in this Calabiao fourfold. And we also managed to do the whole birational map to the standard Weierstrass fabrication. So in particular, those sections are now uh, associated with the line bundles uh, that depend on canonical divisors of the base and the two special divisors, S7 and S9. And in this particular specification of sections, we are now set and, and are able to uh, basically construct uh, all the possible DP2 elliptic vibrations of this type. So uh, uh, for specific case in four and, and, and uh, six dimensions, uh, we can actually parameterize all such vacua of these DP2 vibrations for a fixed choice of the base. For example, if I choose the base to be P3, then the, uh, such uh, elliptically fibered Calabiao, uh, we, we're, uh, that is actually now generic, with all the sections SI that I specified in the elliptic curve to exist, turns out to be uh, 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 parameterized just by two integer numbers uh, associated with the multiples of the hyperplane divisor in the base. And basically, those are all topologically distinct DP2 vibrations with model way uh, group two. Similarly, if we turn out to constructing uh, uh, examples with a grand unified gauge group, the, uh, the actual uh, Calabiao is not generic. In this case, now, some of the sections are special. In particular, if we blow them down at four, uh, for, for four particular sections, at this point, it turns out that the symmetry is increased, increased to SU5 symmetry. And uh, again, the classification of all possible vibrations now is uh, uh, a little bit more constrained with fewer choices of the corresponding integers. So now I would like to turn to uh, describing how we actually uh, describe the appearance of matter in such compactifications with two, uh, two U1s, and basically how they are related to appearance of co-dimension two singularities in this particular DP2 elliptic vibrations. So as I argued, uh, while uh, there's no singularity uh, uh, associated with this uh, 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 vibration that has uh, uh, three rational points. It turns out that actually when we look at the matter, there will be appearance of co-dimension two singularities in the base. And this is basically associated with the fact that when two uh, of such uh, divisors collide, the, uh, the fiber becomes singular. And it turns out that the singular fiber gets resolved. And in this case, it gets resolved uh, in, in, into a sum of two reducible curves. One is a matter curve, P1, associated with the matter, and the other one is actually the original singular fiber. So uh, we use this resolve picture to identify the representation of matter uh, for this particular uh, DP2 vibration. So the idea is the following. We look at, uh, uh, in particular, to f study one type of matter that appears in such vibrations. We look at the collision of these rational sections, Q, P, and R, okay, with the singularities once Weierstrass vibration reaches singular, uh, could I mention, to singularity. And then we resolve it, and then we identify the nature of the matter curve and the uh, uh, leftover fiber. And so uh, with this procedure, when we look at collisions of the, uh, the rational sections with a singularity in the Weierstrass vibration, we identify three types of matter, actually depending which of the, uh, 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 which of the rational sections hits the singularity and identify the three types of matter through corresponding intersections of uh, rational section divisors and the matter curve. Uh, those are typical standard representations of matter. 
uh, in the perturbative deep brain picture. So that you would expect naturally, but they are the, the other type of matter as well. It turns out that this uh, rational points, um, uh, when promoted uh, to sections, are actually ill-defined at certain locations of the of the S9, S8, and other sections. So, in particular, when both of uh, when we look at the uh, loci of zeros of S9 and S8 the fiber associated with the p-point is degenerate, and so on. So in this case, what happens is that the section no longer corresponds to a point in the elliptic curve, but it starts wrapping the whole p1 in the resolved Calabiao. And in this case, actually, the interpretation of the matter that appears at this singularities has charges that are non-standard and non-perturbative. So for this particular classification, we have actually gotten the complete representation of possible matter uh, under U1 cross U1 symmetry. Now, if we make our uh, Calabiao non-generic, we can also realize GUT, SU5 GUT with two additional U1s, and we can apply analogous techniques to find the full matter representation. So for example, for this specific flow down of four sections uh, that produce SU5, uh, at particular point in the base, so we obtain representations that are for which the fives, a set of fives correspond to type one matter, but we have uh, uh, also of, uh, fives in that type of matter in addition to 10 bars. So uh, we actually with this procedure, we have gotten completely the possible matter representations, both under U1 cross U1 and as well as SU5 and U1 cross U1. Now we want to ask ourselves how many of these representations we get. And when we are looking at the six-dimensional compactification, this would correspond to just kind of counting the number of points when those uh, 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 divisors intersect. Okay? So actually the number of points where this could have measured two singularities appear. And uh, it turns out that for the second type of matter, uh, uh, they satisfy the complete intersection conditions, and we can determine the number of points just by counting the degree of polynomials SI and SJ. Analogously, now it turns out to be harder to determine the multiplicity, the number of points associated with appearance of matter of type one. It's actually this now constraints become a complete intersections described by prime ideals. Uh, actually, there are a bunch of polynomial equations for which we would have to count the number of uh, uh, solutions. And actually, it turns out that we can resort to counting such points via the so-called horizontal resultant of the polynomial systems, which allows us to also determine all the number of those points as well. So with this procedure, actually, we can completely determine the multiplicity of the matter that we analyzed, and now we can apply it also to other examples in other uh, 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 studied by other people. And so actually this is the first time that multiplicity has been determined for the rank uh, two um, Mordeve group. So just one example. Let me choose now a specific uh, a base. So let the base be P2, those is our general type one or type two matter. Now we can classify all the possible DP2 vibrations in general, basically in terms of two integers that were constrained uh, from previous discussion. And this is the outcome in terms of those integers for the whole uh, class for all the possible DP2 elliptic vibrations when the base is chosen to be P2. Actually, in, in six dimensions, we can generalize that to any base. We can also uh, now address that for the case of non-generic Calabia when we have SU5 symmetry appearing and also can get the full spectrum at multiplicities. Uh, as a byproduct, we actually check that the spectrum is consistent in the sense that it uh, cancels all six-dimensional anomalies. So it's independent check that our geometric procedure works precisely. So now I have just a small amount of time left, and now I have to. Uh, uh, I would like to briefly summarize a hundred-page paper that actually discusses the chirality, uh, the determination of chirality for four di uh, for the matter in four-dimensional compactifications. So, uh, with five minutes left, 
let me point out first that when we are looking at the four-dimensional compactification of F-theory, in this case, the nature of matter representations, with Mordeve being of rank two, is still the same as the one we identified in six dimensions, because all the action happens in the fiber. Okay? So representations are not an issue. The issue is to identify the chirality of this matter, and this is actually related to specifying the so-called uh, matter surfaces and for uh, uh, G4 flux and integrating such uh, G4 flux over matter surfaces that for specific, uh, specific representation will produce for us the, uh, the chirality. So this would be the geometric way, first principle derivation of chirality for the particular representation of the matter. Well, for that we have to do two things. We have to properly identify such matter surfaces, which now uh, are related to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, four-dimensional complex submanifolds, and so as a consequence uh, in four dimensions, in the base, the matter does not appear at the point anymore, but at the matter curve. So we have to identify matter curves now in the three-dimensional base, and then uh, find associated matter surfaces as a vibration of matter uh, um, as, uh, uh, of the curve in the fiber over these matter curves. And this can actually be done only like for type two matter where we could find intersections very easily, number of intersections in six dimensions, but for type one it turns out to be hard and we have not solved this problem yet. On the other hand, we can also calculate the G4 fluxes in this context by, uh, by evaluating the determining the whole basis of the so-called vertical fort uh, 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 cohomology. And actually, this, this turns out to be the first calculation of such fluxes uh, uh, where we have uh, the rational uh, uh, sections introduced. Uh, so for at least for the type two matter, when we have these fluxes, consequently, integrating the such fluxes over corresponding matter surfaces produces for us uh, uh, chirality. Okay. Now, how about the rest? Okay. Uh, there is actually, there would be the whole new lecture, but there is a complementary way of trying to extract properties of chiral four-dimensional theories, uh, F-theory, via M-theory, F-theory -the duality. And actually, this duality goes in, uh, via three-dimensional analysis. Namely, the procedure, the way we would view this duality in this context is we, l we look at the, our F-theory compactive I on four-dimensional singular uh, fourfold and uh, identify in four-dimensional massless chiral matter, but then we proceed and further uh, uh, reduce this theory on a circle, and in this three-dimensional theory go onto the so-called Coulomb branch, where we have only leftover abelian gauge symmetries, and uh, 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 try to analyze features of this three-dimensional and equal to supersymmetric theory. Via F, M theory duality, this three-dimensional theory actually would be related not to the full M theory on a singular fourfold, but actually it would be related to supergravity theory reduced on the result fourfold, yes. So, uh, so through this duality, actually, we could do our supergravity calculation okay, and try to relate features of the, of the effective action of supergravity to the features of the corresponding field theory uh, that comes from the F-theory side. Okay. Of course, the match is only in the infrared, and we have to integrate massive states. So the core thing in this analysis is that in three dimensions, when we do that, for 11 dimensional supergravity, we encounter three dimensional Chern Simons terms, which are completely classically determined in terms of theta parameters that come from integrating four full flux over corresponding uh, wedge, wedge product of one one forms on a uh, result uh, fourfold. Now, from the F theory perspective, sub G, G, G4 is now uh, 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 the corresponding. Uh, Simon's terms are actually now different in or origin. Some are classical, and they actually correspond to gauging of Ramon Ramon axioms in four dimensions and generalized Green Schwartz mechanism. But some are appear at the loops, 
and they are due to in integration over all the massive fermions in the Coulomb phase of the corresponding F theory. And as you see, this particular turn simons term coming from one loop calculation is proportional to the chirality of matter representations. So let me, uh, I'm, I'm just almost at the end, just one or two minutes. So with this, <laughs> with this connection between F theory and M theory in three dimensions, actually we now get conditions on the allowed F theory for fluxes. So in particular, we constrain this uh, G4 fluxes from M theory in such a way that the classical ones from M theory calculation will be set to zero for all theta terms that are zero on the F theory side uh, because they are neither classically induced, we set them to zero, or they are not generated at one loop. And the rest of the allowed uh, fluxes will produce the rest of the theta terms for us, and so this is basically formulating how to constrain M theory G4 flux to make sensible contributions to F theory interpretation of 4 flux. And uh, it turns out that actually with this procedure, uh, all the surviving uh, 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 turn Simon's terms actually determine fully all the chiralities and all the anomaly constellations through this connection. So this is an example, for example, of such con constraint for forum flux for the uh, example uh, when the base is P3 and symmetry is U1 cross U1, so it's parameterized now by, uh, I believe, uh, three parameters. Uh, so this is complete determination of, of uh, chiralities as well as the anomaly cancellation, the similar methods applied to constructing that in SU5 or SU1 models. Again, in this case, now constraints on G4 flux in F theory uh, turn out to be in terms of seven parameters. We get again all for the chiralities this way and anomalies are checked. Uh, uh, and in addition, we can actually check now the, the type two matter uh, uh, geometric calculation against the chiralities we get in the from M theory F theory duality flux constraints. So let me. This is basically the summary. I'm out of time. Is basically summarizing what I did at the beginning, but I should maybe say one word about the outlook. Basically, with this proposal, we have developed techniques to really construct global models with multiple U ones. Of course, we want to uh, push that in four dimensions to generalize it to other bases, not just the P3, do uh, complete supersymmetry conditions on four foreign fluxes and study phenomenology. Another more formal approach is how about formally developed techniques for more than two U1s? And well, here I have to announce things because it's brand new that actually uh, uh, we, uh, we are in the process with another great student at Penn, Peng Song, to find rank, rank through Mordel uh, Vale, Calabiao manifolds. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, it turns out that we have complete interpretation of the corresponding uh, elliptic curve. Thank you. Well, um, lunch started 10 minutes ago. Any questions? <laughs> Come on. So, uh, E8 uh, points may be interesting for phenomenology in the context of F-theory, and you could imagine you ones coming from the extra gauge factors involving E8. Are any of your examples relate to that in any way, or have you we thought We don't about understand the parts, how we can, well, which parts can actually be related to non-abelian enhancement of symmetries. Some of them are actually massive. Some of these ones are massive in, in the language of, you know, generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism, uh, and uh, some are massless, but we don't understand uh, how, you know, collisions with enhanced symmetry points. Would, but this is, those are all very important questions to be addressed. So um, I think it's time to thank Miriam again and go for lunch. Thank you.